previously on the Sojo Files. Next thing I know, I hear screaming. Something's wrong with Olivia. In a panic, I call 911. It is. Crawford County 911. Hey, all right, hey. All right, let me call you right back. Once I had dispatch on the phone, I realized I'm not exactly sure why I was even calling. So I told them I'd call back and went to figure out what was going on. It was also frantic at the time. Eva was holding Olivia. I couldn't really see much. My heart was racing. I used my finger to quickly check for a pulse. I thought I felt one. But with the frantic state I was in, I now realized that was probably my own heartbeat. I call 911 back and tell them we need an ambulance. Crawford County 911. Hey, can we have an ambulance sent to 2210 Granite Circle? 2210 Granite Circle in Van Heeren. What is this? I don't know. Hold on. Uh, uh, 22 Granite Circle in Van Buren, Arkansas. All right. Give me one moment. Let me get you to Van Buren. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I then realized EMS were on the way, and I had my drug friends in the car. Not thinking clearly, I ran out to the car to take them back home. Welcome to season two of The Sojo Files. This season has been in the works for over a year now as of last week. And on this season, we will be covering the murder of two-year-old Olivia Soto, which led to an innocent man being on trial for that murder, the state of Arkansas versus Jordan Michael Shreve. On this episode, we are going to be going over what happened after Jordan called 911 twice and who arrived on the scene when and what they claimed to have done. Now, the reason why I say what they claim to have done is because even though this entire episode is going to be me reading to you all directly from the incident reports written by each officer on the scene that day, There is no body cam footage from that day at all from any officer that was on the scene. So we are relying on them at their word for what they claim to have done because there is no footage to verify it. That being said, let's get into it. Jordan's first 911 call was placed at 12.15 in the afternoon. We know that Jordan checked Olivia's pulse and then immediately made his second 911 call requesting an ambulance. Then, several minutes later, Eva makes a 911 call and hangs up. Proper County 911. Yes, I need uh, an ambulance at 22 kids. Okay, well. According to the Van Buren Police Department's incident reports on file for this case, Officer Chase DeCrew is the first officer to respond and arrive on the scene that day. The arrival time listed on DeCrew's report is 1220. Officer DeCrew writes, I, Corporal DeCrew, was dispatched to 2210 Granite Circle in reference to an unknown medical call that had came into Crawford County 911. The mail caller asked for an ambulance at that address and hung up, according to dispatch. When I arrived on scene, I was met at the door by a female, later identified as Eva Millard, who was the mother of the victim. I kept asking her what was going on, but she would not tell me. She was not crying, but seemed distraught. Instead, she had me follow her down a hallway to the back bedroom where she pointed to a child's body that was lying on the bed and said, My baby is not breathing. 
I looked at the child who was laying lifeless on the bed wearing only a diaper. The child appeared to be a three-year-old and was not breathing. I checked for a carotid pulse and when I did not feel one, I picked the body up and moved her to the floor. When I touched her neck to check for the pulse, it felt cooler to the touch than normal, but the chest was warmer. When I placed her onto the floor and removed my left hand that had been supporting her head and neck, I felt and heard a crunching sound. I then noticed that she had dried blood in and around her nose and mouth, as well as a large amount of dried blood pulled in her right ear. I heard the mother saying something about how she thought she must have tried to climb out of her bassinet slash pack and play. When I went to check for a radial pulse, I ran my hard, I'm pretty sure you meant hand, down her right arm and noticed her body was significantly cooler than the rest of her body from her elbow to her wrist. Despite this, I began CPR, giving compressions and rescue breaths until first responders and EMS arrived. I discontinued CPR when EMS hooked her up to leads and checked for cardiac activity. I had the mother escorted out of the bedroom while EMS worked. However, there was no activity detected. While EMS personnel were still checking the EKG, one of the first responders noticed that there was blood in the hallway. After it was clear that nothing could be done for the victim, I began to treat the scene as a crime scene. I advised Corporal Wooten to remove the mother from the house and asked EMS and first responders to exit as well. I could hear the mother getting loud and crying in the living room as Corporal Wooten was trying to escort her out. However, she did not want to leave. I advised dispatch to contact CID, Criminal Investigations Division, and have them come to the scene, and I walked into the living room to assist Corporal Wooten and tried to get everyone outside so I could get their names to start a crime scene log. The mother, Millard, was escorted to my unit and placed in the back seat. I returned to the house and while making a quick check of the interior to make sure everyone was outside. I located an elderly man seated in a wheelchair smoking a cigarette in the garage. The male was identified as James Shreve and he stated that he had been inside the garage for about 20 minutes as he was just starting to smoke his second cigarette. He stated he did not know what was going on and had heard the girl, Millard, yelling and screaming. He stated when he looked through the threshold of the door, she was holding the child in her arms, yelling, and then the next thing he knew, the police were walking through the front door. I asked Shreves, Lord have mercy, they don't proofread these. I asked Shreves his relation to the mother, and he stated that she was his daughter-in-law. I then asked him if the child was any relation to him and he stated no and that the child belonged to the mother from a previous relationship. He could only tell me the child's first name and that she was two years old. Shreve stated that the last time he seen the child was the previous day for about 20 minutes. Shreve's went on to say later that his son, Jordan Shreve, had left around 9.30 to go job hunting. I left James in the garage and went back to the living room where I noticed more blood pooled on the seat of the couch and in the hallway. Corporal Marsh was the first member to arrive from CID, Criminal Investigations Division. I briefed him and then released the scene to him while I maintained the crime scene log and taped off the entrance to the front and sides with crime scene tape. According to police records, Officer Chase DeCrew arrived on the scene at 1220 and left the scene at 235. According to the reports, Officer Wooten arrived on the scene just two minutes after Officer DeCrew arriving at 1222. Officer Wooten writes, I, Corporal Wooten, responded to assist Corporal Chase DeCrew and EMS 
on an unknown nature medical call at the residence of 2210 Granite Circle. Upon my arrival, I noted that EMS was pulling in right behind me and I heard Corporal DeCrew announce that he had a child not breathing and was commencing CPR. I observed that the child appeared to be a female toddler and that she was laid in the floor of the master bedroom and Corporal DeCrew had already commenced with administering CPR. The mother of the child was also present and appeared to be in a state of near hysteria. EMS came in right behind me and began setting up for advanced life support treatment. At Corporal DeCruz's request, I took the mother, Eva May Millard, out of the bedroom and began trying to get some information from her while EMS worked on the child. I took her to the kitchen area of the house and had her sit down and collected her information as well as her child's information. I also asked her if there were any outstanding medical conditions with the child such as chronic illness or allergies, to which she said no. I then asked her when the child was last seen by anyone inside the house and she advised me that she last saw her around 4 a.m. Millard said that the baby had been sick and kept them up all night long. She said that she finally got her to sleep around 4 a.m. and that she just woke up moments before the call to 911 and found her daughter in the floor. She stated that she thought that she must have crawled out of the pack and play where she sleeps and hit her head. She reiterated several times that the child had a history of climbing out of the pack and play. While I was trying to calm Millard down and getting information from her, James Shreve opened the door to the garage area and looked into the kitchen. James Shreve seemed to have a surprised look on his face and did not appear to know what was going on. He was reportedly out in the garage area to smoke a cigarette. I did note that there was an ashtray with several butts in it lying on a cooler near where his wheelchair was sitting. Millard continued giving me her information and Corporal DeCrew advised me that we need to take her outside. I then began helping him to escort her out to Corporal DeCrew's patrol car. Millard tried pulling away and had to be nearly restrained, but we secured her in the back of Corporal DeCruz's car until CID, Criminal Investigations Division, could come to the scene. I asked Millard for the information on her new husband, who had apparently left the scene just as the 911 call went out. She identified him as Jordan Shreve, who she had just married yesterday. I asked her if he had used any mood-altering substances or intoxicants, and she said that he hadn't to her knowledge. I also asked her if there was any incidents of him losing his temper with the child, and she could not tell me of any. A few minutes later, Detective Wesley Marsh arrived on scene, and I briefed him on what I had learned from speaking with the child's mother so far. When I clarified when Jordan had left the residence that morning, Millard could not give me an exact time. She said that she thought he left around 8 or 9 a.m. because he woke her up telling her that he had to go help a friend. And that when she woke up later, then she found the child in the state that we discovered it in. Jordan Shreve returned to the scene approximately 45 minutes to one hour after we had already been on scene and appeared to be emotionless and completely calm. He claimed that he had taken a friend home, later identified as Billy Freeman, because he didn't want to leave him there in case they had to go to the hospital. Jordan, along with Eva Millard, were both eventually transported to the Van Buren Police Department for interview by CID. I kept the elderly James Shreve in the front seat of my patrol car while the scene was processed by CID. After Corporal DeCrew transported Millard to the Van Buren Police Department, I took over the crime scene log and maintained it until the scene was cleared. 
Jordan Shreve's vehicle was towed to the Van Buren Police Department by White's Towing and placed into the evidence building for processing by CID pending a warrant. Records show that Officer Wooten arrived on the scene at 12.22 and that Officer Wooten left the scene at 3.17 p.m. As Officer Wooten mentioned in his summary, EMS was pulling up at the exact same time that he was, and on the record, EMS Callie Bernard as well as EMS Mike Alec both arrived on the scene at 12.22, the same time as Officer Wooten, and they are on record as leaving the scene at 12.55 p.m. So we have Officer DeCrew arriving on the scene at 12.20. We then have Officer Wooten arriving second on the scene at 12.22. At that exact same time, you have EMS Callie Bernard and EMS Mike Alec also arriving on the scene. Next on the scene are three Van Buren firefighters, Michael Bass, Richard Davis, and Chad Ewald. They have the three firefighters arriving on scene at 1223. They then list all three firefighters as leaving the scene at 1250. After Officer DeCrew, Officer Wooten, two EMS, and three firefighters arrive on the scene, next on the scene is Detective Marsh. Detective Marsh wrote, I, Detective Marsh, was called in reference to a death investigation at 2210 Granite Circle. Upon arrival, I spoke with Corporal Wooten and Corporal DeCrew. Corporal Wooten stated that there is a deceased small child in the residence and the cause of death was not known. I spoke with Officer Hernandez, which, side note, arrived on the scene four minutes after Detective Marsh, and had him obtain consent to search the residence from Eva Millard. Officer Hernandez had Millard sign a written consent form indicating her consent to search the residence of 2210 Granite Circle. I then photographed the interior of the residence and secured the perimeter. Corporal DeCrew told me that he overheard the mother saying something about Olivia possibly crawling out of the pack-and-play. Corporal DeCrew also handed me the EKG strip that was administered by EMS. I walked through the residence and made the following observations. The couch in the living room had what appeared to be blood soaked into a cushion. There, a small piece from a diaper, which was the tab used to close the diaper, on the floor next to the couch. There was also what appeared to be blood on the tile floor in the hallway. There was a nightstand that was in the kitchen that had possible blood on the front. There was a trash bag in the trash can in the kitchen. I looked inside the trash bag and there were wipes with possible blood on them. The hallway was to the right of the living room, and the hallway had three bedrooms, two closets, and a bathroom. The first door on the left was a full bathroom, then a hall closet, then the master bedroom. At the end of the hall was a small linen closet, and across from the master bedroom was another bedroom that appeared to be James Shreve's. Again, I did not write these and they clearly did not proofread them and I am reading them to you word for word exactly as they are. There was a heat and air closet next to James's room and another bedroom that was across from the full bathroom. The bedroom across from the full bathroom was a kid's room. In the master bedroom, there was a small child, later identified as Olivia Soto, laying on her back. Olivia had dried blood around her mouth and nose and also had dried blood in her ears. Olivia was cold to the touch and rigor mortis had set in. 
Olivia had bruising around her left eye and forehand. (sighs) I'm pretty sure he meant forehead, but who cares about getting it right? There was also bruising around Olivia's left cheekbone and the left side of her jaw. The master bedroom had a bed against the east wall and had a nightstand on either side of the bed. There was a pack and play at the foot of the bed and the pack and play had bedding inside of it. There did not appear to be any blood in the bedding of the pack and play. There was a dresser that was against the west wall and in front of the pack and play. There was a closet next to the dresser, which was used for clothes and food. On the north wall was the door for the half bathroom. The half bathroom had doors connecting it to both the master bedroom and the full bathroom. The bedroom across from the master bedroom had a bed that was covered in blankets and laundry, except for a small area to sleep on. There was an oxygen machine to the right of the bed and against the west wall. The bedroom across from the full bathroom had a kid's bed in the northeast corner of the room and had a mattress on its side against the west wall. There was a swab taken from the possible blood in the hallway, a swab taken from the possible blood on the dresser, and a swab taken from the couch cushion. The section of the couch cushion that was covered in blood was taken if further analysis is needed. I collected the piece of diaper and also collected the trash bag from the kitchen. In the kitchen, there was a package of wet wipes on top of the nightstand that was collected. I collected the blankets and sheets from the bed in the master bedroom. I also seized the bedding and mat from the pack and play. While collecting the bedding and mat from the pack and play, I found a yellow pill that was under the bedding but on top of the mat. I collected the pill and it was later identified as Colazepam 0.5 milligrams. Next to the pack and play, there was an Arkansas Razorback body pillow and due to the proximity of this pillow to the pack and play, I collected this pillow. There was a toddler onesie collected that was on the floor next to the dresser that had what appeared to be blood on it. In the half bathroom, there was a black iPhone collected that was on the counter. In the bedroom, across from the master bedroom, there was a clear trash sack of gloves and other items that was collected. The coroner was notified, and upon the coroner's arrival, Olivia was released into the custody of the coroner's office. I then went to the residence of Pamela Shreve, whom is the ex-wife of Jordan Shreve. There was no answer at the door, and I left a card at the front door. I went back to the police department where Jordan Shreve and Eva Millard were already being interviewed. Detective Marsh is on record as arriving to the crime scene at 1236 and exiting the crime scene at 317. As Detective Marsh mentioned in his report, when he got to the scene, he talked to Officer Hernandez, who arrived on the scene just four minutes after Detective Marsh. I, Officer Hernandez, on November 8, 2018, while on patrol, assisted Corporal DeCru at 2210 Granite Circle in reference to a death investigation. On arrival, I assisted Corporal DeCru secure the scene and checked if any further assistance was needed while CID conducted their investigation. Shortly after, Detective Marsh asked me if I could obtain written consent from Eva Millard, who was sitting in Unit 4. 
I went and asked Eva Millard if she would give written consent to for law enforcement personnel to be inside her residence. Millard granted consent and signed Van Buren Police Department document stating she gave consent. I then turned over the documentation to Corporal DeCrew and Detective Marsh. Due to patrol division being shorthanded, I then left the scene without incident. The record has Officer Hernandez arriving at the crime scene at 1240 and leaving the crime scene at 105. Next, at 1259, Detective Perry arrives at the scene. On November 8, 2018, I was called to 2210 Granite Circle in regards to a deceased two-year-old. When I arrived, I observed a two-year-old white female laying in the bedroom floor of the bedroom in the southeast corner of the house. The mother, Eva Shreve, and her father-in-law, James Shreve, were outside the residence when I arrived. I asked Eva where Jordan had gone, at which time she told me that he had to take a friend of his, Billy Freeman, home. She told me that he left a few minutes after he called 911. Once we determined that Billy Freeman was the subject that he took home, I contacted the sheriff's office and talked to Sergeant Patty Stroud. Her and another investigator made contact with Billy at his residence, at which time he agreed to come to the police department and talk to me. Approximately one hour later, Jordan Shreve pulled up in his black Chevrolet pickup. I then asked him where he had been, at which time he told me that he had taken his friend Billy home. I then asked him if he would come to the police department so we could talk to him, at which time he agreed. Per the Van Buren Police Department's reports, Detective Perry arrived at the crime scene at 12.59 and exited the crime scene at 2 o'clock. Next on the scene, arriving at 1.17, is Detective Ware. I, Detective Ware, was contacted by Sergeant Perry in reference to this incident. I went to the scene and assisted him and Detective Marsh. When I arrived, EMS and first responders had already left and the crime scene had been secured with evidence tape and was being controlled by Corporal DeCrew. When I went into the residence, I observed blood on the floor in the hallway. I was led to the back bedroom on the southeast corner of the house where I observed the female two-year-old victim laying just inside the doorway deceased. Detective Marsh also pointed out areas of the residence where there was blood located. Detective Marsh pointed out blood on the floor of the hallway, on a cabinet in the living room, on the couch in the living room, and on a dresser in the bedroom. I did two swabs of the blood for DNA testing and secured them in my unit. The swabs were taken from the living room hallway and from the dresser in the back bedroom. The swabs were taken with distilled water and with sterile swabs and were secured in my vehicle for transport to the Van Buren Police Department evidence room. After leaving the scene, I went to the Van Buren Police Department and secured the suspect's vehicle, which we had seized for evidence. I assisted the wrecker driver in putting the vehicle in the search bay where it was secured for a search warrant. The vehicle was secured and was not entered by myself or the wrecker driver. We went underneath the vehicle and put it in neutral to put it on the rollback and when he got back to the PD, he went back under the vehicle to put it in park. After the vehicle was parked in the search bay, I secured the vehicle with crime scene tape. According to the police records, Detective Ware arrived on the scene at 1.17 and exited the scene at 2.37 p.m. After Detective Ware, 
both Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Robert Presley as well as Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Brock Price arrived at the crime scene at 1.45 p.m. According to police records, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Robert Presley exited the crime scene at 2.25 p.m. and Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Brock Price exited the crime scene at 3.11 p.m. Next to arrive at the crime scene, according to police records, is Deputy Coroner Steve Edwards, and according to police records, he arrived at 2.17 p.m. However, according to Steve Edwards' report from that day, he arrived on the scene at 2.10 p.m. On Steve Edwards' coroner report, he wrote, When I arrived on scene, I was met by several Van Buren police and Detective Marsh, who informed me that we had a two-year-old dead in the bedroom. When I walked through the scene with Detective Marsh, he pointed out blood on the couch, drops in the hallway, and the decedent laying on the bedroom floor. She appeared to be around two years old, two feet long, and approximately 35 pounds. White female with bruises to her face, blood in her nose, mouth, and right ear. She was in full rigor except her neck, which was loose and grinding. Core body temp was 83.5. Coroner Pam Wells and Deputy Chris Price were also on scene to assist in the investigation. According to police records, Deputy Coroner Steve Edwards left the crime scene at 3.17 p.m. However, according to Deputy Coroner Steve Edwards' paperwork, he left the crime scene at 4.08 4.08 p.m. And according to the EXIF data from images taken that day, Deputy Coroner Steve Edwards as well as Detective Marsh were actually still both on the scene at 4.09 p.m. taking pictures of Olivia's body on the floor still, which means they still would have had to bag up the body and get the crime scene all finished out, but that's a story for another episode. The last two people to arrive at the crime scene, according to the police report, is Coroner Pam Wells as well as Deputy Coroner Chris Price, who are both on record arriving at the scene at 2.38 p.m. and exiting the scene at 3.17 p.m. That concludes our who's who, who arrived when, left when, and who claimed to have done what at the crime scene that day according to the Van Buren Police Department. And as you can see, we are just getting started and there are already plenty of issues. I will see you all on the next episode.